Now here's a few more things on communication. One is to have something good to say, and number two is to say it well. Now here's number three. This is where some people now start to lose it, and that's to read your audience. If you're talking to a child, you got to read. Because we have that expression, right? Do you read me? So if a child now is listening, you need to know whether or not they read you. Are you getting it? If you're talking to a large audience, you need to know if they're getting it. I had some trouble with this now in the beginning because I used to just lecture with all my notes and just keep on going. I think in those early days, some of the audiences could have left, right? And I would have just, you know, kept right on going. It took me a while to look up and see what's happening. Do I need to slow down? Do I need to speed up? Do I need to get a little softer? Should I save that for some other time? Is this a little too strong for now? You get that by reading your audience what's happening. I remember the first time I spoke to 10,000, Zig Ziglar was along. Zig Ziglar and Paul Harvey and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. This was a long time ago, back in those early days. And I think we were in Kansas City, 10,000. I'd never spoken to 10,000 people before in my life. Wow. Zig said to me, Jim Rohn, you better be good and you better watch what's happening. Because when 10,000 people turn on you, you're in trouble. I thought, whoa. So this time when I'm up there lecturing, I'm looking in the balconies, right? I'm looking everywhere to see if it's going okay, going okay. I'll never forget that experience. So if you got this now, you've got to read the face of a child. You've got to read what's happening so you'll know how to proceed. So now let me give you three ways to read. Here's the first one. You read what you see. Pick up the signals you can see. If you're talking to somebody and they got their arms crossed like this and their chin tucked down and they're frowning, hey, this one looks like you got, you got your work cut out for you. This one's not going to be easy. So we pick up those signals by what we see. Somebody's leaning toward the door. That means you got to hurry. Okay. They're not going to be here long. So we pick up what we see. Now here's the second one. We pick up what we hear. Mama said to me, if you want to be a good speaker, you have to be a good listener. If you want to communicate well with someone, you talk, let them talk. You talk, let them talk. In fact, Mama said, with two ears and one mouth, you should listen twice as much as you talk. I thought, that's not a bad idea. So listening helps you to pick up the signals what to say next. You listen to someone's comments, and then you answer the question, or you continue the conversation. So we pick up what we see, second we pick up what we hear. Now here's the third one that's a little mysterious. You've got to pick up what you feel. Here's another place where women have it a little over the men, because they learn to pick up these emotional signals where a man might ignore them. A woman seems to sense it. Women have this incredible antenna. They pick up everything, especially danger. Women are so good on danger. I think that was Way back, Papa's off providing, Mama's home protecting. And she learned to recognize the sounds. She learned to recognize when there might be danger out there. So she developed these incredible instincts. Women have it. Men can learn it. It takes a little more for us to learn, but women seem to have it built in. In the middle of the night, the baby cries. Mama's awake. Papa sleeps. Mothers sleep near the surface, waiting for the least little sound. Or in the middle of the night, she nudges her husband and says, go look, go look, go look, something isn't right. He said, I'm telling you, everything's okay. She says, go look. He says, okay. He gets out of bed, stumbles downstairs. The front door is open. How did she know? They just know. I don't know how they know. Interesting analogy in the Bible. Here's what it said. There are shepherds and there are sheep and there are wolves. Pretty standard, right? So you got to make the note. Shepherds, sheep, and wolves. Right. Sheep have got to look out for the wolves. Shepherds got to be careful. Keep the wolves from getting the sheep. But that's not the end of the story. Here's what it says. You got to be so careful because some wolves have learned to dress up like sheep. Now you need a woman. Man says, looks like a sheep, talks like a sheep. Woman said, ain't no sheep. 
I don't know how they know. They just know. When I was putting some enterprises together years and years ago, when I was interviewing someone to be part of the enterprise, I used to have women sit in that worked with me. And when the interview was over, I knew what I heard and I knew what I saw. But I would ask her, what? How did you feel? She would say, hey, I felt good. Now I didn't always take it into account, but I never left it out. Or she would say something, something, something. Women know this something stuff. Something tells me something. What is that? I don't know. But here's what it can be. Very useful. Never ignore it. Now, men can learn to pick up these emotional signals. Signals that tell you, you shouldn't talk this harsh, you should back off a little bit. Yes, there are some things you should come on strong, but I'm telling you, come on. This is part of what we all can learn. Pick up the emotional signals. So number one, have something good to say. Number two, say it well. Number three, learn to read your audience. Now here's number four. The fourth key to good communication is intensity. The power of your emotion. Because there's certainly a difference in intellect and emotion. But here's the key, they must work together. The intellect, the language, and the emotion. Now the question always comes, and some of this you have to decide, you know, in sort of a split second, how much emotion. So jot this down, enough emotion to fit the occasion. Enough emotion to fit the occasion. Or enough emotion to fit the point. You don't need a major explosion for a minor point. Some kids have an honest beef by saying you make too big a deal out of a little deal. And this is good for parents to learn. Leave a little deal as a little deal. Don't make a big deal out of a little deal because that's too confusing. Now, if it is a big deal, you make it a big deal. But if it's a little deal, right, that's too much emotion. That's too much sometimes to handle making such a big deal out of a little deal. So this emotional content you now in what you say is very important because the emotion is so powerful. In fact, it's the emotion that drives the language that speaks to the heart and the mind and the soul. It's the emotion that drives the language to speak to the heart. It said on the day the Christian church was started, a magnificent sermon was preached to a multitude, huge crowd of people. And it said some that heard this fabulous presentation were smitten, they were hit by the message. They were hit by the words. It got them like a sword. Can words be that powerful that it smites, grabs your consciousness and shakes it up, drives it to your heart? You say, whoa, yes. But the key is you have to use it wisely. Not overuse, proper use. Words are like a little straight pin. I buys a shirt, right? It's got all these little pins, so you take these pins out. What if I took one of those little straight pins and I threw it at you? And that little straight pin hit you in the face or hit you in the arm. You'd feel it. But what if I took that little straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about this long and let you have it? See, I could drive the pin through your heart. So make the note now. The pin is the words. The iron bar is the emotion. Talk about effective. If you learn not to just use your language, but if you learn to use your emotions, your effectiveness will multiply by two, by three, by five, by ten. And emotion makes all the difference in the world in the word. Key. Measured emotion with well-selected words. That's what's powerful. Measured emotions. Not too much, not too little. We say, don't shoot a cannon at a rabbit. That's too much firepower. It's effective, but you got no more rabbit. 
one of my speaker friends said, you should have been there the other day. I blew them all away. I said, oh no, where are they now? You blew them all away. That's not necessary. Now, too little emotion. When an actor on the stage or in the movies, they have to this. A good script with properly measured emotion. Not too much to look ridiculous for the point or for the occasion. And not too little to lose the effect. You say, wow, this is a pretty good art to learn. It is. And guess how often we're faced with it? Every day. What to say and how much emotion to put into whatever we say. Now next, let's talk now about being effective in what we call tools of last resort. These are highly emotional tools, and if you're skillful, they can be very useful. But you've got to underline the word last, tools of last resort. When we're dealing with problems and challenges, when we're dealing with opportunity and promise and future, sometimes we have to use these tools of last resort. Not to be used unless there's like no hope left, and this is the only thing left. Old Joe Kennedy taught his son, John, a key phrase that can be used so many ways. I want you to jot it down and then we'll go through it. Here's what old Joe taught John. If it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. If it is not necessary to change, it's necessary not to change. Now the key is also with these tools of last resort. If it's not necessary to use these tools of last resort, it is necessary not to use these tools of last resort. So now let's talk about tools of last resort. Here's number one, your temper. Now there are occasions when it's okay to lose your temper. I mean, it's because there's no hope left. The only way to correct the situation, perhaps, is to just let it all go. But here's the key to temper. Not every day and not all day. As a tool of last, last, last resort, you might resort to your temper. There's only two or three occasions recorded where Jesus lost his tool. Just two or three. But when he did, the whole community knew about it. The day he yelled like a Comanche, grabbed a whip and drove them all out of the temple and kicked over the tables and the money scattered everywhere and so did the people. And he cleaned house. But not every day. Just on a, two or three occasions. He used some unbelievable, powerful language. Jesus, anybody would use that language would fear for your life. But he didn't use it every day didn't use it on every occasion because he talked to little children and then he lost his temper. temper the full range of emotions gentle with the children and when the occasion called for it let it all go so we got that now tools of last resort tempers one if it is not necessary to lose your temper it is necessary not to lose your temper hang on to it next a direct attack where you go after someone directly. Usually to solve a problem, we go indirectly. Let me tell you about the man who said it was going to be okay and it wasn't okay. Here's what I told him and he ignored me. Here's what happened to him. Now you're trying to get this message across to somebody you're talking to, but instead of telling them directly, you use the illustration. Here's what we call it, third party. Rather than direct, sometimes you use third party. To talk about something that you don't want to be so confrontational with someone, you talk about someone that you've had this occasion to talk with this particular problem before. Here's how we solved it. Here's what happened. Okay. But then sometimes it's called for direct. You. But you got to be very careful. Here's why. Emotional, highly charged emotional conversation deals with matters of the heart. And when you deal with matters of the heart, you got to be very careful. Even if the heart needs an operation. If you were about to go under to have a heart operation and you heard the doctor say, hand me the hatchet, you'd come awake. 
So make this note now. You can't, you can't operate on the heart with a hatchet. When you get ready to operate on the emotions and the heart and the spirit and the soul, you got to be very, 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 very careful. Next, scolding. You got to be very careful of scolding because it is so highly emotionally charged, especially in public. You got to be very careful. If somebody walks in late, you say, "Where have you been?" See, that's loaded. That is. You wouldn't want to do that unless it had happened so often, and there was no other hope to correct the situation, to blurt out something like that. But on the first occasion, no. You find other ways, but as a tool of last resort, you could use scolding. You've got to be careful in scolding your children, only when it's totally necessary and called for. What if you scolded your children all day long, all day long, all day long? Here's what scolding does: it sort of cuts to get somebody's attention. Now the cut will heal, and maybe you needed to cut somebody to get their attention. And now you can cover the matter, and it's okay. And finally, someday it'll be forgotten. But if you did it all the time, some parents scold their children all day. They cut, 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 cut. And yes, it may heal, but who knows what psychic scars may be left by being slashed every day, cut every day, cut down every day. So have you underlined it now? Tools of last resort to scold. Some things are too severe. Some language is too severe. Causes more harm than good. Some punishments are necessary, but we consider some punishments a little too severe. In some countries, if you steal, they will cut off your hand, and we say, "Well, that's, that's a bit much. Maybe a little piece of the finger, maybe, but you know, not the whole, not the whole hand. But it is effective." You say, "Did you ever steal anything else?" He said, "You kidding? With one hand? I mean, you know, my stealing days are over." But now, remember, now jot this down. Now, severity only when it's called for. Severity only when it's called for. Not to be used recklessly because you've got the ability to talk and use it. To save it. To save it. To save it. If Mama screams all day, see, it finally use, loses its effectiveness. Kids learn to just tolerate it. Someone comes to visit, and they say, "Don't mind, Mama. She's just a screamer." That's right. She just screams all day long. See, now it's lost its effectiveness, and now it could be tragic. The little three-year-old is headed for the street, and a truck is coming, and Mama screams. Everybody ignores it. If Mama saves up her screams so that the day she screams, the world stops, and everybody around their blood turns to ice water. Because she saved it up and used it as a tool of last resort. Isn't this helpful? This help me. Now jot this down. The more you care, the stronger you can be. When it comes time for strength and power, and maybe temper, and maybe using tools of last resort, here's where they can be useful: is if you really care. The more you care, the stronger you can be. All of us will allow somebody to really get on our case if we know they really care. But if we don't think they they care, really care, we would resist all efforts to browbeat us or to do some things as a tool of lessons. Only if somebody really cares. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hell fire for my sinful ways. Don't mind that, as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. Wouldn't we all resist a dry-eyed sermon on hell fire? You can't preach hell fire for human beings unless you sob and the tears flow. But if you preached hell fire for human beings with dry eyes and your heart wasn't broken. All of us would dismiss that sermon as a performance.